Hi, it's Shal from Pangolin Photo Safaris and in today's video I would like to guide you through my setup of the Canon EOS R6 for wildlife photography. I have used the R6 extensively during the past few weeks and coming from a DSLR I first had to figure out a few tweaks in the menu to fully unlock the potential of this mirrorless camera. So the settings that I will provide you with are my personal preferences resulting from the experience I gained during this time. And of course, I will also share my favorite custom button configuration, including the setup of a very effective dual autofocus system. So grab your camera and let's get started. I've reset the R6 to its factory setting so that you can easily follow along. Within the camera's quick menu, we can already adjust a few basic but important settings. I prefer to shoot in manual mode with the ISO set to auto, but of course, you can choose any other mode by rotating the top wheel on the R6. If you are interested to know why we think manual with auto ISO is the perfect shooting mode for wildlife photography, then you can check out the video link here on top. I always have servo autofocus enabled which ensure that the camera continuously focuses on the moving subject and for the drive mode I choose high speed continuous plus where I can fire off a series of shots when holding the shutter button down. Essential for birds in flight and generally being ready for any action. As for the light metering I like the camera's default light meter which is evaluative. If you're not sure about the different choices, please have a look at this video where Sabina gives detailed information about a different light metering mode. Okay, so this is all that I want to mention in the quick menu. So let's go into the main menu, starting off with shooting menu number one. Here you can decide on the image quality. I personally always shoot in RAW, but new on Canon cameras is the compressed RAW format that give you almost double the amount of photos on a memory card which can be useful if you run out of storage space. For those who are shooting JPEG, the new high format might be interesting. It is a little bit confusing to find where to turn it on. You have to go to the second tab in the shooting menu. Find HDRPQ settings and enable the feature. If we now head back to the image quality settings, JPEG has been replaced by the Hive format. Without going into much detail, the Hive or high efficiency image format has more dynamic range than your traditional JPEG file of the same size, which gives you a little bit more room to push the highlights and shadows in post. In tab number two, you find the ISO speed settings. These are important if you like to use the auto ISO feature like me. Since the camera will adjust automatically the ISO, depending on the different lighting situation, you might want to set an ISO limit. I personally have set a rather high value of 25,600, as I do not want to be restricted too much in low light, and I found noise levels up to this sensitivity acceptable if the situation demands. Although I shoot in RAW, I like to set a white balance preset like daylight to have a consistent color temperature throughout a series of shots, which make color correction of a group of images a lot easier than using the auto white balance setting and having to color balance each image separately. The in-camera color space settings don't affect RAW files in any way but they do change the look of the embedded JPEG preview image. Adobe RGB gives a slightly more vibrant look and a more accurate histogram to determine the correct exposure. For anyone shooting in JPEG, I suggest leave it on sRGB as most applications and devices work with this color space. Unless you really have done your homework on color profiles and you know what you're doing. I haven't changed anything in page 4 and 5 of the shooting menu and heading to page 6 we now have the option to set the shutter mode. My preference is using the mechanical shutter as 12 frames per second is plenty in my opinion and I mostly use fast shutter speeds where shutter shock isn't an issue. This way I also don't fill up my memory cards as quickly or 
run into any rolling shutter issues. I only ever switch to the electronic shutter when I need complete silence, for example when shooting out of a height or if I feel I need a higher frame advance of 20 frames per second. Please make sure to turn off release shutter without card because you really don't want the camera to fire without the memory card in case you forget to insert one. To save battery life and avoid any distractions while shooting, I have set image review duration to off and the viewfinder review disabled. What I have enabled though is the exposure simulation, which for me is one of the biggest advantages of shooting with an electronic viewfinder as now I get immediate feedback on how bright or dark the image will look like. On page 8 of the shooting menu, I have changed the display performance to smooth instead of power saving, which make the movement of fast birds and animals look more natural within the viewfinder. The autofocus menu is where it gets exciting and we can unlock the full potential of this mirrorless camera. Tracking autofocus has become very effective, but isn't perfect in every situation. So I will show you how I have set up a dual autofocus system to instantly switch between the traditional autofocus modes and the animal eye tracking to have the best of both worlds. By the way, if you would like to see how the animal eye tracking perform in real life, please check out my review on the Canon EOS R6 for wildlife photography right here. And as always, if you found our videos helpful, please take the moment to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on new content. We really appreciate your support. Okay, so let's go back to the setup. As this is a two button setup, you need to decide whether you want the back button setup or you prefer the traditional shutter button for focusing and rather prefer only one of the back buttons for your second autofocus method. If you do decide to keep the front shutter button for focusing, then you don't need to do anything right here. But for back button focusing, it is essential to disable the shutter button for focusing and enabling the AF on button to do exactly that. Okay, moving forward, let's head to page one of the autofocus menu. Under autofocus method, select spot autofocus. The eye detection will now be grayed out and you will have full control over where you want to focus by positioning the spot autofocus on the desired subject. Now we want to add the animal eye tracking as the second autofocus method. Obviously we have to assign another button for this. In the custom button menu, select a button of your choice and assign the eye detection autofocus. I like to use the star button for this. As a last step back in the first tab of the autofocus menu, we need to decide which eye detection should be enabled. And for wildlife, that would be animals. There you go. As long as you keep the star button pressed, animal eye tracking will be active and you simply use the shutter button in front to take the image. If you want to change to regular focusing, you let go of the star button and use your main focusing button as usual. The only thing that you need to remember is to switch back to people eye detection whenever you're getting back from Safari. Still on page one of the autofocus menu, please make sure to disable continuous autofocus. This has got nothing to do with the server mode to track subject but simply means that your camera constantly focuses at all times, which is unnecessarily straining your battery. The touch and drag autofocus setting is a new feature that allows you to use the rear LCD to move the focus point when looking through the EVF. I leave this enabled with the relative positioning method and right active touch area. In the autofocus menu number three, you will find four cases or presets to use in different situations. These cases are basically four different combinations of two settings, tracking sensitivity and acceleration deceleration tracking, which you can also customize to your own preferences. 
There is no perfect recipe here, I'm afraid, as it very much depends on what you shoot. What I suggest is that you add these two settings to the green custom menu, so that you can access and change them as needed. Most of the time I set the tracking sensitivity to be locked on, which helps to keep a subject in focus even if I briefly lose the focus point on it. The acceleration deceleration tracking on the other hand I set to plus one, which is more responsive to subjects that suddenly move change their speed or stop abruptly. If this is all too confusing for you, you can simply use the auto option, which does a great job too. Heading to page four of the menu, we find switching tracking subject, which describe how Swift autofocus switches from a currently tracked subject to other subjects, but this time it is only applicable to the tracking mode and zone focusing. I have kept mine on default setting and this seems to work just fine. Shooting with the new animal eye tracking, I found limiting the autofocus method has almost become redundant and I now either use the spot autofocus point or the tracking. However, out of habit, I still have limited the autofocus selection method to cycle through them quicker if I ever need to change them. And I like to do that using the main dial rather than pressing the manual function button. Now there is an option in page 5 of the autofocus menu called Initial Servo Autofocus Point for Face Tracking. By default this is set to Auto. I have experimented with all options available but to be honest can't see much of a difference. Most photographers seem to have set it in the first option which I have adopted as well. If you have a better understanding of this feature and feel that there is a significant difference I would appreciate if you leave me a comment below. Playback menus are used for altering images after they are captured. I normally do not mess with these and leave the settings in tab 1, 2 and 3 at default. The only settings I change are for the viewing purposes. First, I make sure that magnification is set to actual size, so that I can easily check the sharpness of an image. I also like the image jump to be at 10 images at a time. This way, I can jump through many photos quickly by using the top dial or one by one with the rear dial. Last, I enable the switches between the index finger dial and the top dial to quickly scroll through and zoom in and out of images. On page 5, I enable the highlight alert function as well as the autofocus point display to see clipping in the highlights and check if focus was accurate. Network 1 and 2 is used for managing Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connections, something I do not need and therefore I have airplane mode turned on as well as the GPS disabled which will help preserve battery life. Moving on to the setup menu, I set the recording option for both stills and video to auto switch card. Once the first card fill up, it will now overflow to the second one without me having to prompt it in the menu. On page 2, I selected NTSC as my video system. Although I live in a PAL region, I prefer this setting as it enables video shooting in slow motion at 120 frames per second instead of only 100 when PAL is selected. As battery life is very precious on a mirrorless camera, it is good practice to set up some power saving options. I have the display turned off after 15 seconds, the viewfinder after 1 minute and the camera going into standby mode after 1 minute as well. If you are in desperate need of more battery life, you can also make use of the echo mode which dims the screen after 2 seconds and goes into sleeping mode shortly after. It can be quite irritating though having to wake up your camera every few seconds, which is why I assigned a dedicated button to switch the echo mode on and off as needed. And that brings us to the next menu which is the custom function menu. There are many parameters here that you can change to fine tune your camera. Most of them I leave on a factory setting, but I do like to customize some buttons to suit my shooting style. You can enter the customize button feature on page 3 of the orange menu or simply via the quick menu. 
Although almost all buttons can be programmed separately for stills and videos, which can be useful to some, I like to set mine up identically as I only snap a short video clip here and there and don't want to get confused. First up is the shutter button, which I only use for metering and actually taking the image. So I disable the autofocus on this button. Instead, I make use of the AF on button in the back of my camera, which is set to metering and AF start. This concept is called back button focus. And if you are not familiar with this, I suggest you watch Janine's video, which describes why this can be a big advantage in wildlife photography right here. Next, I will make sure to set the star button to eye detection as discussed earlier to complete the setup of my dual autofocus system. The depth of field button isn't very comfortable to access and therefore I wouldn't decide anything that I change on a regular basis. But for those few occasions where the battery runs low, I use it to quickly change to echo mode. The menu button right next to the viewfinder is also a little awkward to reach with your eye against the viewfinder, which is why I chose to set the manual function button to enter the menu instead. Since I shoot manual with auto ISO and basically never adjust the ISO directly, I could easily modify the new third wheel on top for the exposure compensation. The thing is though, that I still shoot with my DSLR next to the R6 and since that one doesn't have the third wheel and I like to keep things uniform, I use the old fashioned way of assigning the set button for exposure compensation which then works with holding set while adjusting the index finger dial. Last but definitely not least, let's activate the joystick for the direct focus point selection which enables you to use the joystick at any given time to move the focus point to the desired location without having to press another button first. I left the custom dials untouched as the factory settings are perfect for me. But as mentioned earlier, I quickly changed the custom buttons for video to be identical to my photo settings. As you can see, the menu of the EOS R6 is quite complex and you might find that it sometimes takes too long to dial through all the menu tabs. Don't worry, as Canon has got you covered and offers to add items that you use often to your own menu. Simply add the My Menu tab, hit Configure and select the items you want to register. I like to keep it simple and only add the shutter mode and as shown before the tracking sensitivity and acceleration deceleration tracking for quick access. And there you go. I hope this video was helpful as sometimes it can become quite overwhelming to set up a new camera. Especially if there are so many options to have the camera match your personal preferences. By no means am I saying that my settings will be suitable for all of you, but I do hope that they give you some food for thought so that you can create a setup that works for you. If they did, please don't forget to like this video and enjoy photographing with your Canon EOS R6. Until next time, keep well and bye bye.